Yeah, uh, very excited about the class. Like everybody else in America is excited right now. So that's, I always say, check back with me in three years and let's re go through this list and see what we really did and what we didn't do. But uh, the things we do know about this class is uh, a lot of really good students uh, in this class, a lot of really high, highly competitive kids um, that that have had a lot of success and are very, very motivated to, to be successful on and off the field. Um, they were very talented in high school. How that game translates to college, you never know. Sometimes the kids you're not as high about become your best players and you're all Americans. And sometimes the kids that seem to be the most successful in high school, their game doesn't translate to the college game. So you, it, is an, it is an inexact science. Uh, but we are excited about the, the depth of the class and the quality of the class, in particular the quality of the individuals. You've been talking about You've been talking about the uh, size, how you want to get bigger. Are you pleased with either the size of the guys you have or their potential for growth? Yeah, both. Both. One, just our old line is long and big. There's some 280, 290 pound kids, which if you looked at our old line last spring, the kids we're bringing in would have been bigger than the line we lined up last spring ball. So um, both. And then the other positions were longer. You know, we got six foot DBs with long arms, long legs. You know, we got more length at linebacker. We certainly got a six, six, three, six, four receiver. Um, so six, five tight end. So kind of more like last year, but last year was kind of a mini class because we just got here and kind of pieced it together with this year, you know, all, all 20 plus kids are kids that have the length and the size and the growth potential. Uh, like you mentioned, that you're not only looking for the size, but you're looking for guys that can add and become stronger and faster. And, and there's some some body types that are that way, and there's some body types that aren't that way, and you got to try to be be good at picking the right ones. And five guys on each side of the, of the offensive and defensive line. Was that an area of need that you identified yeah. coming in? Yes. I mean, it, we, we tried to identify a little bit last year, you know, but you can't really fix it. Um, the old line in, in four weeks, but we, we need a bunch of linemen. You know, at one point we had seven different old linemen committed. One's, you know, one's going to West Virginia, one's going to Purdue. So we were on some really good kids. Um, we had two other tight ends committed. One's going to Iowa, one's going to Michigan State. So uh, we were on some really good kids and convinced really good players to come play in Miami. Now, eventually we ended up losing some of those kids, which is fine. But, you know, some of the kids I think can play at the level of those kids are still here and with us. So you try to shoot for the moon. But, O and D line in particular is where you got to win the game in the trenches. We did a lot of better things last year in football here than we had previously, but we still didn't really win any battles in the trenches. You know, I think one game last year we ran the ball effectively all year, well, and we really didn't stop the run. And, and I, as I tell people that, oh, you're so much better, you're so close. I said we're not as close as you think because until you can win the line of scrimmage, which we're still far away from. If I look at the top O lines in this league and the top D lines league, we're still far away from those. Yeah, we smoke and mirrored it a little bit with our perimeter play but we when we get really good and really legitimately can battle for a conference championship here it's when we feel like we got an offensive line that in the fourth quarter on the one yard line or fourth and two we can run the ball and get the ball where we need to get it did, did you get a sense that the facility plans and being able to show these kids did you get a sense that that played a role in being decisive for some of them at all? or Yeah, I think it was all part of that package. I think, you know, they come in, they look, inspect everything. And, and if you have uh, no no facilities or no plans for facilities, that's a mark against you. Will that mean you can't get a really good kid? No, but that may be, hey, if everything else is even and they like their facilities better, that would be – I mean, I think most people nowadays, you know, they look at the academics, they look at the campus community, they look at the town, they look at the coaching staff, they look at your current record, um, they look at past – past success but they certainly nowadays kids look at facilities and they look at uniforms I mean, those are two those are always things that kids are talking about wow you got the got those cool helmets or wow man that indoor is crazy you know because that's that's a visual that's easy to see so that certainly played a big part in in, in helping us and, and will continue to play a big part coach uh got to it kind of uh, a little bit uh, later last year what was the biggest difference between recruiting last year and recruiting this year. I think in a way it seemed like you uh, tried to get out, out front of it uh, a little bit instead of trying to play a little catch up. Yeah, obviously last year we were scrambling. We had three weeks to do probably two years worth of work. And then even this class, we tried to do one year work that really takes two years, you know. Uh, we, we were still behind on the class that we just signed. Um, that because we hadn't we got started late like I said we had a junior day last Saturday we had 75 juniors here well 
that Saturday a year ago, we weren't even thinking about juniors. We didn't start ju thinking about juniors till the week after the signing date. Well, other people I already had kids committed, so we're, we're continually get caught up from, you know, that's part of being a new staff. So um, the biggest difference, though, is we know this place better. Last year, we were just – Hey, we're a good school. We have a good tradition. Hey, there's some good coaches. Coach here, you know, Ben Roethlisberger is. I and mean, we had the we had the Cliff Notes version of Miami. Now that you're here for a year and you can really sell Miami from things you've seen with your own eyes and relationships you have with, with real people. So to me, it's a lot easier to sell this year with this class because we got to know Miami as the year went on and really could speak from the heart to these kids and really look parents in the eye and say, listen, this is what you're getting yourself into, you know, if you want to be a student athlete at Miami. Personnel a lot better as well, not just the facilities, but your own personnel and needs. Yeah, we're still proud. I mean, that will be a bigger deal when we have a good team. We have needs everywhere still. I mean, we're we're still up against it. Personnel, size, strength, and speeds and speed and maturity. We're we're still you know we we did some better things this year as far as being competitive, but physically we get out physical every week and typically we get out s speeded every week you know I don't think that's a word but we're going to use it anyways um, we don't have as much team speed as the teams we play we have a couple guys here and there but overall team speed so we're still a, a year or two away from getting physically where we want to be as a division one football program it looked like you were uh, uh, might have some uh, pretty good talent coming in at the DB, did you? Uh, how hard did you work that? And did you hang around any basketball courts? No, we're, we're still looking. So I, I, I do have the APB out that if the, if anybody sees you're watching, and March Madness is right around the corner. I love. I'm gonna be watching a lot of college basketball coming up. If anybody sees a lockdown point guard defensively, like an explosive defender that shoots the ball like Joe Kim Noah or Quentin Rollins, so he probably is not going to move on to the NBA because he can do everything he needs to do physically to cover people, but the ball spins on a different rotation of Saturn as opposed to spinning the way a basketball should spin. Just call Coach Martin, send me an email. doesn't even have to be a Miami point guard. It could be uh, any point guard in the country, and we have a pretty good track record with those kids of – turning them into first-round draft choices. So we've, we've got a good sell for that kid, I'd say. <laughs> um, do you anticipate any of these kids being able to step in? Um, yeah, I think – like somebody asked me that, the internet question was a good question. I'd, I'd say 25 30% of these kids I think will probably impact us in some fashion. I don't know which because, I've, like I said, I always tell the story where – I had to replace a good quarterback, and I spent a lot of money on two, and I spent almost the, the third one was basically a walk-on, and then the third one became my three-year starter and my All-American, and the two guys I spent all the money on were his backup. So when those things happen in your life, you learn, like, don't try to figure it out. Just get him here. Let's get pads on. Let's start training him. And the nice thing about football, you can't really hide out there. You either make plays or you don't. You can't really say, like, you know, I'm, I'm okay. You either go out there and make plays at your position and you physically dominate. You know, so we just kind of let the kids go out there and play. But I think there's enough physical ability. Um, th they're going to, you know, they're going to walk into our locker room. They're not going to look like the freshmen. You know, our offensive linemen aren't going to look like the freshmen. Not, not that saying that we don't have any offensive linemen in our program that don't look like them. We do, but we got a lot of offensive line programs that don't look like them. Like we're going to have juniors and seniors on offensive line that don't look like the freshmen that walk in the door. They're not as big and strong and physical as they are. That's just reality. And I, I'm not knocking them. They're going to walk in. The kids are going to be bigger and wider than they are, you know? And so there'll be some kids that physically can't, can't compete right away. How quickly can they figure it out and learn schemes and have the confidence to go, go against division one players that all, that's the, always the factor that the raw materials, you know, but, the adjustment period, you really don't. What kind of an impact do you feel like you had this year, like locally in the in the southwestern Ohio area? Did you feel like you were getting in more, uh, uh, that you were more recognizable, having spent a year on the job? Yeah, we've we've we've. I think the Midwest coaches recognize that Miami football is working their tail off, not working harder than anyone, but working as hard as any other Division One program to recruit the Midwest. And like I always say, to evaluate the Midwest. I always, I've talked to a lot of coaches. You got to, I got to get some kids at Miami. I said, let me evaluate because beauty's in the eye of the beholder. But as as long as I'm evaluating your kids and we're evaluating them first, like we've offered fifty some juniors that are all in the Midwest. We haven't offered juniors from Florida or Texas or Baltimore or Minnesota or Colorado or some of the other players in our team. Is every single offer we have out there, and we're gonna have another slide. I always say just just make sure we're in your building and we're evaluating and we're gathering information on your kids. And if we don't offer them, 
don't hold that against us because we got a great place and we're working our tail off to try to find the best players. And obviously every high school coach thinks that they've got the right guy and they should. They should be pushing their kids hard. You would, that's, I mean, the ones that don't, you're disappointed in them. But so we are making a huge emphasis. And you look at our, our roster I talked about during uh, our show we just had is I just count as a Midwest. It's not Ohio. It's not Southwest Ohio. Like I got a kid from Richmond, Indiana. Is that that doesn't count because it's not, you know, kids from Indianapolis, kid from Cove Cath, which is less than an hour from here. Does that not does that count against me because Covington Catholic isn't in the state of Ohio? Because I really go from Chicago to St. Louis, you know, through Kentucky, up through Cleveland, Youngstown, Michigan. To me, that's all our backyard, and we want to scour that and evaluate every single kid and any kid that we evaluate that we like, obviously offer them and let them like they're getting the first offers and the first opportunity to say, yes, that's why most of the kids in this class are Midwest kids. The kids we have from farther away, we typically offer during the season. So if they took a scholarship from an Ohio kid or a Midwest kid, shame on the Ohio or Midwest kid, because we offered you six months prior. You had, you had plenty of time to take our offer. But we also want to keep tracking those Midwest juniors that, hey, maybe is that late blooming kid. Maybe he's a 16-year-old junior that really should be 17. He hasn't hit his stride to keep evaluating those kids that maybe they have that breakout senior year and we haven't shut the door on those Midwest kids. Midwest kids is Ian Lever, uh, the off the tackle. He's already enrolled. Yeah. How, how does it benefit you the, and, the, and the program and him getting him already in? Well, obviously, it benefits him greatly from academically. He's going to have 12 to 15 college credits while people are still trying to figure out if they can get a prom date, you know. Two, football, he's in our strength training right now. I said, I called him this morning. I, felt, I said, I feel awfully, and, like, everybody, this is their day. National signing day. I'm going to get up in the morning, and I'm going to sign this paper, and it's going to be really cool. That I'm going to go to school, and everybody's going to be talking about it. Typically, everybody has that press conference after school, and – or they have the school down at noon and everybody signs. And Ian was in the weight room at 7.30 with Coach Harker grinding through a college workout, which he's still getting used to. I said, I feel bad for you, big fella. But he made that sacrifice to get ahead, get ahead academically, get ahead in football. And he's already doing that. He's been here for four weeks with the J term, and he's already getting stronger and more athletic. Coach, I had a chance to look at a little uh, vi video on Billy Ball. Um, uh, there's some looks like some impressive stuff in there. Uh, what's your feelings about uh, uh, getting him in the fold? Yeah, I love Billy. The things, all the video you've seen is junior, because we didn't let Billy put any senior video out anywhere known to man. He's been basically on a lockdown vault. So everybody's like, God, I watch his tape. He looks so good. I said that's junior highlights. So you should see his senior highlights. Uh, he's he's got all the tools. He's big. He's six three, six four range, six three plus. He's two hundred ten pounds, thick lower body. Uh, undeveloped upper body like a lot of kids that are his age. He just hasn't filled out yet because he's this longer kid. He's going to be 235 pounds, and, and, you know, you're talking, and he can run. Like, he's, he's known as this pocket guy that can really sling it and make all the throws that – I mean, he can make a lot of tough throws look pretty easy, and he's a high school senior right now. But he's – because he's big, everybody assumes he can't run. He can run zone read. He can run power read. He can scramble. He's got really good drops. He's been really well coached. So – um, like I said, I, I would have recruited him at my last job. I think he's that caliber of talent. Now, how he pans out here, we'll see. He's going to have to do it. Uh, he's going to have some other good competition here. But he he has a huge, huge ceiling potential. He's he's the one I've, you know, when he committed to us last spring, it's been a long time getting to this day for me. Like, I woke up this morning, I said, I might actually be able to tell the world what I really think of Billy Ball today because I really don't. Everybody asked about our quarterback. I was like, yeah, he's all right. You know, he plays this little small school in Chicago, and he's, he's, he's a really, really talented young man. Did he verbal on Father's Day? Yes. Yes, so it's been a while. Kind of a nice gift. Then. Yeah, no, was a, and that's why I told him. I said, it's pretty good Father's Day. I wish we could have signed him that day. It would have been nice. I'd have slept a lot better the last 10 months here. Uh, one of the guys you flipped from Western Junior, McMullen, uh, kind of a late change. Was that kind of chaotic trying to get him to come here? Yeah, his, rec his recruiting, you never know. There's no, you know, we recruited the kid for a week. We haven't, he was one of those kids, he was basically committed to Western before we ever talked to him. And then uh, him and West, uh, we didn't really flip him from Western. Him and, him and Western had already mutually parted. He said, she said deal. I wasn't involved. I don't really care what happened or didn't happen. They have one side of the story. He has another side of the story. As we all know, somewhere in the middle, probably the truth, <laughs> truth be told. But whatever, they had, they broke up. And really, it really came down to us in Northern Illinois. Northern Illinois got him a trip last weekend. And then we came in 
last Monday, Pat Welsh came into his high school. He had not talked to Miami coach in months, and he had just got done tripping Northern. And we, you know, were the Monday before the signing date, and Coach Welsh went in there, did an unbelievable job. With the high school coach knows me and what I've done, so we had a little bit of juice there. And then Coach Hauser, coach one of the other assistant coaches, so we had a little bit of help there. But basically, Coach Welsh convinced the kid, the coach, and the mom to, hey, you just looked at. You know, you've been coming to Western, you just looked at Northern, why not look at Miami? You got one more weekend, you might as well look. You've kind of created a little stir by looking already. You might as well continue the stir. So on Wednesday, we didn't know till Wednesday night he was going to come on Friday. We didn't know, you know, and he hadn't been on our board. I mean, we haven't, literally, I hadn't talked to the kid since last May. It's the last time I talked to the kid. Then the week before the sign day, we got this really special player. And we get him on the weekend visit and pull the rabbit out of the hat and he's committed to Miami, so. You work for two years, three years sometimes, and you can't get kids committed, and I, I wish they were all as easy as that. Come in the Monday before the signing date, recruit them really hard for one week, and have them sign, and you got a really good player from a really good program. I have a similar deal with the tight end, Alex. I'm not going to try to pronounce that Zelinsky. last name. Z Zelinsky? Okay. Yep. He kind of changed late from Central. I'm sure the coaching situation had something to do with that there. Yeah. How'd you I think he, he, was, he was a kid that came to our camp last summer, wanted to come to Miami. We didn't have a spot for him at that time. We basically had told him and his family, if we ever have an opening, we're gonna, we'd love to have your kid. Once again, Coach Welsh did a great job. He stayed with that kid all through the season, even through his commitment. I'm sure the coaching change had something to do with it. I think he was waiting for us to have a spot, and he would. I think we'd have got that kid regardless of what happened at Central. But that's my personal opinion. But I am the one talking right now, so I get to give it. It doesn't get. Uh much more local than, than Oxford yes. uh, with Maurice. Those are nice. Why couldn't they all be there? <laughs> Recruiting would not be near as bad if you only had to go uh, two miles to go see the kid. That's wonderful. The home visit was nice. I literally left three minutes before the home visit started and made it on time. Uh, I would imagine that uh, he would be one of those people that uh, – uh, very talented, and you bring him in and see where things uh, work out one way or yeah. another with him. The biggest thing with Maurice is, you know, Talawanda's smaller size school, level of competition. That's a knock on Maurice, and I always laugh when I hear, well, he doesn't play anyone, you know. Okay, well, I, I know people hold that against kids, but my deal is you're – you're watching a kid and looking at his traits. It's not different than the NFL. There's plenty of guys from the NFL from the big schools. There's plenty of guys in the NFL from the small schools. And the reason is because they don't really care where you play. They they care about your God-given abilities, how fast you're, how strong you're, what's your size, what's your hands, you know. So Maurice is the one that has all the skill set, you know, and I think he was hurt that he played at Talawanda High School, and it's not known as a hotbed of football. It's certainly off the beaten path. And many coaches, you know, it's not like you go to Talawanda on a yearly basis to find Division I football players, and it's not in Cincinnati where you're just going to stop by and say hello and find out who they have. So I think his skill set is, is pretty pretty incredible. We'll see if we are right or wrong, but I really think he, he could play at a really, really high level uh, with his, with his God-given genetics, his speed, his strength, his elusiveness, his vision. Uh, so I think we got a kid that's got a chance to be really special and really maybe was a little bit of victim of, of where he was at. A lot of times you can look at the, at the class and say, well, they're really making some inroads, establishing some relationships in such and such a state. We're doing it everywhere. State. You're we're doing so it everywhere. And we're doing the Midwest. We are, are you know, you know, we're on group me and Coach Barnett, our offensive line coach, is sending me a picture and an eval on an offensive lineman from Green Bay. And he's not flying, he's driving. And then the next picture I get from him is from Evansville, Indiana. An old lineman in Evansville, Indiana, that he just evaluated. Watch him, watch him weight train because we're looking at these juniors and we can't talk to them and we can't recruit them. But we can't evaluate him when we're out. We're, he's, he's watched a kid work out in Wisconsin, and then the next day he's in Evansville, and he's not flying. And that's the amount of ground my guys are cut. My guys are working their tails off. So we're trying to, we're trying to blanket the Midwest. And, again, we're going to miss kids in the Midwest because it's impossible. There's so many dang high schools. But we're not trying to miss any of them. And our, and our assistants – have covered so much ground. That's why we had – I mean, it's all, I've never been part of a 75. We literally sat here December 1st and said, listen, should we have a junior day in January, finish up the seniors? Can we get enough groundwork to actually have a junior day? Are we going to have it set up and then 10 people are going to come? And I said, well, if we get 15 or 20 of the right kids, even if it's a smaller day, 
if they're if they're kids we really like, hey, they're on our campus. That's you know that's would be a good day. And seventy five showed up. It was almost a disaster because we, I in my mind was not prepared. And then we had junior coming in on official, and now all of a sudden we weren't even going to have an official, and we had junior on official, and uh, we have seventy five juniors, so it became kind of hairy. But that's those are the good problems to have as a head coach. That all of a sudden you got seventy five juniors, so like twenty of them had BCS offers. And they're visiting us for a junior day, which usually once they get the BCS offers, they're not looking at Mac school. So our kids are, our coaches are scouring the Midwest. And a lot of those kids that came, they came to our junior day because they, our guys had been in their school twice. And they know they've been in school, watched them play basketball, you know, and have done things that other people haven't done. So they are, we are trying to have our footprint all over the Midwest. And then we're definitely trying to have a footprint in Georgia because Georgia's really good football, not too far away and drivable from here. And but then we got a Baltimore kid. We don't recruit Maryland. We got a Baltimore kid. We don't recruit Texas. We had two Texas kids. We lost one to Kansas the last weekend. You know, I think we lost seven kids to BCS schools that we had committed here, which everyone's like, oh, doesn't that suck? I'm like, not really. We're recruiting great. But hey, if we recruit 22 kids and they're all BCS type kids, maybe, and they, we lose some, okay. Well, what if we didn't lose them? We don't know which ones you may or may not lose. So you just keep plugging away. But we lost, we had two kids rec- committed from Texas. We don't recruit Texas. Like, we don't have, if you said, which, raise your hand, which coach has Texas, no one would raise their hand in the room. You know, we got kids from Carolina. We don't recruit Carolina. So we, we're, we're covering – once we get out of the Midwest, then we try to find a kid under a rock in Alaska, you know. Is there any difference – like uh, when you came in last year, the uh, offense uh, didn't have that good of numbers. And yet last year you managed to put up some really, really good numbers. Uh, how helpful is that in trying to get in, say, wide receivers or yeah. whatever? No, we threw it around good, which is good. And then obviously Frazier having a really good year and making into a you know a, a one of those postseason pro games, like whatever. I forget. I think he played not. What did he play? Whatever one he played one of those bowl games that the top seniors get to go to. That certainly helps. And then obviously scoring some points and putting up some numbers helps. And um, but still, we're we're mostly when it comes to football recruiting off our track record. You know, we we have not lost a kid to a team in our league that's visited our school. We've lost lots of kids to teams in our league that they never visited here. But we're one year in, and I thought we were going to lose one late, and I told the kid, you're going to be my first kid that I've lost that I've actually got on campus and recruited. So we are we are knocking it dead, and a lot of it has to do with our reputation of, of winning and our reputation of developing kids to play at a high level. We, we, we got some things we can say that other people can't say. You know, we had over 35 kids at Grand Valley making NFL camps. Well, that's pretty powerful when you're talking to a high school kid as parents and they want their kid to play on Sundays. Not BCS, not Division One, not 1AA. We're talking Division Two. You're talking pretty far down in the food chain of talent you're coaching and to have over 30 kids make it into NFL camps and have a chance to stick. Now, most of them didn't. I think they got seven still in the league, but that's like anywhere getting there and making it that's but getting there is what you're looking for and to take that many division two kids and developing them to play on Sundays that's a pretty powerful message that me and our staff can can put out there looking at the defensive side of the ball size and weight wise it looks like you can be three four and four three was that kind of the goal we're working there I and mean, we're working to get there and we did a little bit late and it helped us against OU um, we'd like to get there permanently where we can be in whatever we want to be and we just you know, you, you can't do it until you have the right personnel. But, you know, the, the Carcagno kid gives us some length of the D end, boundary OLB. I think Hardwick's athletic enough to do that multiple job. But you also need the other job. I think Lemming's a guy that can play outside or inside. We have both issues right now. We don't have really the guy that can be an end and stand up. But we also don't have that three technique that in the three, four can bump out and play more of a four D end type technique. Um, we have some three techniques that probably aren't athletic enough to play the four where I think, you know, the Schroer kid and the Lemon kid can be that three slash four that you're looking for, and we'll see. But And, again, it's still hard to go for – got one or two you think can do those jobs, then you go full transition, one gets hurt and you can't play, or he's just a freshman out race. So we got we got to pile up some classes to really – like I said, I think we're going to continue to get better. I think we're going to be really good here. And when this class is juniors, I think we're going to be really good. You know, and be able to do a lot of things that you're like, well, when did you start doing that? Well, it's always been part of the master plan. We're just growing to get the personnel to do it. Thank you. Appreciate you coming.